I want to do three things. Um, I want to start by uh, situating us in the context of our ecological crisis and what's at stake there. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with us and that's okay. I, I just wanna bring us into that space. Then I want to describe how um, this is a crisis not, that's not being caused by human beings as such, but by a particular economic system, namely the capitalist world system. And then finally, I want to argue that any successful attempts to avert societal collapse will require uh, what in ecological economics we refer to as degrowth strategies. So I'll briefly try to describe what, uh, what degrowth is about. Um, so first of all, uh, to the ecological crisis. So um, of course, we're all aware of what's going on. Climate change is already having a severe impact on human communities. Uh, we know that droughts are ravaging parts of the global south. Um, in Somaliland, in Northeast Africa, 70% of livestock um, have, have recently been wiped out by drought. Uh, in Central America, people are being driven away from their homes in, uh, in mass numbers um, towards North America, where there's more habitable, more arable land. Um, and in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, a number of armed conflicts have erupted um, uh, that are attributed to climate change, right? And all of this is happening at only one degree of warming so far. Uh, things are set to become significantly worse over the course of this century. Uh, even under the Paris Agreements, the, the commitments that nations have made um, have us headed uh, on a trajectory that will get us to about three degrees of warming by the end of the century, right? Uh, within the lifetime of present generations, okay? What will this scenario look like? Um, well, uh, we know that between 30 and 50% of existing species uh, could go extinct um, in a three degrees world. For human communities, aside from displacement due to sea level rise um, and so on, the main concern has to do with food. Uh, we know that yields of staple crops are projected to decline by 30% this century with business as usual. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN warns of multi breadbasket failures and sustained food supply disruptions globally, uh, leading to, um, to famines in multiple regions at the same time. On top of this, large parts of the planet will become physically uninhabitable for human beings, displacing up to 1.5 billion people by the year 2070, according to uh, recent uh, research um, published in, uh, in, uh, in Nature. To put this in perspective, right now there are around 65 million people who are displaced, right? Um, and, we, and already with this level of displacement, it's causing fascist movements to rise, in, uh, international alliances to break down, um, et cetera, et cetera. Multiply that by a factor of 20, and it's clear that, uh, that climate change this century is likely to, to trigger unprecedented political instability, okay? Now, crucially, this crisis is not only about climate breakdown, um, even though that's what we mostly focused on. Um, it's also about other dimensions of ecological breakdown, which are happening at the same time. So deforestation, uh, with half of the planet's mature tropical forests having been wiped out in the past 50 years or 70 years. Um, soil depletion with 40% of, of global topsoils depleted or seriously degraded. Um, UN scientists say we only have 60 years of harvests left in the world's topsoils at our, at our existing trajectory. And species extinction rates. We know that 68% of plants and animals have been wiped out over the past 50 years. I mean, effectively, our, our economy is effectively a death cult. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's wiping out huge uh, portions of the non-human world. Um, and the extinction rate now is around, is up to a thousand times faster than prior to the Industrial Revolution. Um, so we refer to this as the Anthropocene, right? Uh, the Anthropocene meaning the, the first era in which humans have had a decisive impact on geological processes and are shaping the planet. Um, but the language of the Anthropocene actually has it wrong. Not all humans are equally responsible for this crisis. And this is a vital point. Um, take emissions, for instance. We know that uh, a full 92% of total global emissions in excess of the planetary boundary have been caused by the rich nations of the global north, right? So USA, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Australia New Zealand, Japan. The USA alone is responsible for 40% for 40 of those excess emissions. The global south, which has the vast majority of the world's population, has contributed only 8% of excess emissions, which are driving climate breakdown. 
Okay. And yet the global south suffers the vast majority of the consequences of climate breakdown, right? Um, more than 90% of the economic uh, costs are suffered in the south, and more than 98 and more than 98% of the of the climate change related deaths are suffered by people in the south. Okay. Um, something similar is true of resource use. We know that uh, um, you know, one of the main metrics we use to uh, to think about um, you know, our economy's impact on other ecological systems besides the climate is by tracking resource use. Um, uh, excess resource use, right, okay, the, the sustainable level is about 50 billion tons. Right now we're consuming about 100 billion tons a year, so uh, way over the sustainable threshold. All of that, and I emphasize all of that, is due to excess consumption in high income nations, right? If we were all to consume like the average person in the rest of the world, then there would be no ecological overshoot in terms of resource use, right? This is, this is significant. And where does that excess resource use in the global north come from? It's extracted primarily from the global south, right? So the ecological impacts of excess resource use in the north is, uh, um, uh, is inflicted on, on the peoples and ecologies of the south. So the, the Amazon rainforest is being destroyed uh, largely for, um, for consumption primarily in the global north. So too with you know, what's happening with palm oil plantations in Indonesia, uh, you know, cobalt extraction from the Congo, you know, lithium extraction from Bolivia, you name it. Um, so it's crucial to understand that this crisis has clear colonial dimensions, right? Um, and if, if, we're not, if, if our analysis is not attentive to the colonial dimensions of ecological breakdown, then I think we're fundamentally missing the point. Okay. Now we're, we're talking about ecological breakdown now as a global community, but for communities in the global south and specifically indigenous people, this crisis has been happening for 500 years, right? Like capitalism is a system that's 500 years old. It, uh, the onset of capitalism was with the, coloniz was, was with the colonization of the Americas, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that was an ecological disaster that was inflicted on, on indigenous people. And now it's global in its, in its scale, okay? Now, crucially, this crisis is being driven by our economic system, uh, which is capitalism. And let me briefly explain what I mean by capitalism. Uh, when people think of capitalism, they tend to think of things like you know, businesses and markets and trade and so on. Uh, but this actually isn't accurate. Um, markets and trade and businesses have been around for thousands of years. Um, and capitalism is only 500 years old, right? And what makes capitalism distinctive is that it's organized around and dependent on perpetual growth, right? Ever increasing levels of extraction and production and consumption. It requires that. It's the first and only intrinsically expansionary system in human history. If it doesn't grow, it collapses, right? And this is why our, our politicians and our economists are always running around demanding more economic growth, okay? So capitalism needs to grow at a rate of about 3% per year. And that might seem like a small increment, but this is an exponential curve that very quickly becomes dangerous. <laughs> um, so 3% growth per year means doubling the global economy every 20 years or so, right? Um, so over the span of a single human lifetime, it multiplies by a factor of 10, which is extraordinary. Now this wouldn't be a problem if GDP growth was just plucked out of thin air uh, but it's not, it's very tightly coupled to resource use and, and energy use. And that's what's driving our crisis right now, right? So what will it take to arrest these trends in ecological breakdown? Um, well, the dominant focus uh, of our society is on emissions, right? Um, and of course, uh, we know what the IPCC has said, we have to cut global emissions in half in 10 years and get to zero by 2050. Now for high income nations, because they've contributed so much to historical emissions, it has to be much faster than that, meaning zero emissions by 2030. And we think that this can be accomplished solely by rolling out renewable energy. Unfortunately, scientists are quite clear that that alone is not enough. And the reason is because the more we grow the economy, the more energy the economy requires, and the more energy the economy requires, the more difficult it is to roll out sufficient renewable energy capacity to meet that demand, okay? So, uh, so it's, it's, it's infeasible, it's, it's uh, empirically uh, impossible for us to achieve a rapid transition to renewable energy to get to zero emissions in time to prevent catastrophic climate breakdown. 
um, while at the same time growing the economy. Okay, so what do we do? Um, uh, this is where degrowth comes in. Okay, uh, uh, scientists are increasingly clear that what's required is that high income nations actively scale down their energy use. And to scale down their energy use, this is not just about turning off lights in, you know, when you leave a room, et cetera. It's about scaling down unnecessary parts of the economy, right? Scaling down the material economy, because that's what really absorbs, that's what really takes all of the energy. So the, the, more, the, the less economic activity we have in aggregates, um, the less energy we use, the easier it is to transition rapidly to renewable energy, okay? So this is what's known as degrowth, which is a plan's uh, downscaling of resource and energy use to bring the economy back into balance with the living world and to do so in a safe, just, and equitable way, right? Uh, and what the good news is that we know that we can do this while at the same time improving human well being and social indicators. And the reason is because, um, you know, we've been told for so many years that there's uh, that GDP growth is a proxy for human well being. We need to grow the economy to improve people's lives. It turns out this is a lie. <laughs> um, GDP was never designed to measure human well being. Um, it was designed to measure the welfare of capitalism. And the fact that we've all come to see GDP growth as a measure of the welfare of, human well of humans rather than the welfare of capital um, is an extraordinary ideological coup on the part of capital, right? It means that all of us um, are willing to back processes of extraction um, and exploitation because we're, we're, we believe that it's good for us, okay? Um, because the language of growth is very compelling. It sounds so natural and so good. Who, who would ever be in their right mind to be against growth, right? But in reality, we know that it's possible to achieve very high levels of human well-being with relatively low levels of, of, um, of GDP. So the USA has a GDP per capita of uh, $60,000 a year, making it one of the richest countries in the world. And, and yet Costa Rica um, has 80% less GDP per capita than the USA. And yet they have longer lifespan, happy, uh, um, higher happiness and well-being indicators, and better social indicators uh, in many um, other parts of the society. Um, how do they do it? Uh, they do it by focusing the economy on, uh, on human needs primarily um, and ensuring that people have access to universal healthcare, um, education, and, uh, and social security, right? That's what counts for human flourishing. So um, uh, in my last just two minutes, uh, maybe even less, let me just uh, think briefly about what's required um, to get us from here to there in terms of how do you manage a kind of degrowth scenario? The first step is to abandon GDP as an objective and focus on what you want to achieve directly instead of assuming that GDP, uh, that just growing the GDP is magically going to accomplish your object objectives. So if you want to improve education or healthcare uh, or wages, um, target those objectives directly um, and don't worry about what happens to the GDP. Um, so focus your economy on what you actually want to achieve. The next step is to actively scale down ecologically destructive and socially less necessary industries. And we can have a conversation about what that is. Um, do we really need you know, uh, as much SUV production as we have? or arms production or private jet production, um, you know, as much, pub, as much private transportation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as much advertising, right? There are key parts of the economy we can scale down because they're totally unnecessary to human need, okay? Um, of course, as we do that, that means that, uh, you know, there's less labor required in the economy. And so unemployment rates will rise. And normally that is a disaster, but it doesn't have to be. We can shorten the working week and redistribute existing necessary labor more evenly so that everyone has access to the livelihoods they need to live flourishing lives, um, uh, along with access to the leisure they, they need to engage in caring activities, to build relationships in their community, to be politically involved, et cetera, et cetera. This can be done uh, without any loss to people's quality of life um, in terms of their livelihoods by sharing existing income in the economy more fairly, right? So there's no scarcity of of income, there's inequality. By reducing inequality, we take pressure off of the need to grow the economy to meet human needs, okay? Um, and finally, uh, expand universal public goods. So decommoditize the parts of the economy that are necessary for human need and well-being. Um, 
the more that we have access to the resources we need to live flourishing lives on a decommoditized basis, such as universal healthcare, universal education, public tra transportation, safe, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera, the less we need private income in order to live decent lives, okay? So um, decommoditizing universal basic services is really essential to ensuring people can live flourishing lives without needing high levels of private income in order to do so. Now, um, uh, I just wanna really briefly mention that, okay, so um, I see this as kind of crucial to thinking about decolonization. I mentioned earlier how excess resource use in the global north is effectively a colonial process on the global south. So therefore degrowth in high income nations um, uh, uh, is, a, is a kind of form of decolonizing the global south in the sense of it removes pressure from the land and resources and human communities in the global south. And so this is a crucial demand for global justice in addition to an ecological demand, right? Um, effectively what this is all about is shifting from an economy that's organized around extraction and accumulation to an economy that's organized around reciprocity, human need uh, and care. So I'll leave it at that and we can talk about it more in the, in the discussion. <laughs>